Welcome to USAID's Kitchen Sink, a food loss and waste podcast. I'm your producer, Nika Larian. 30 to 40% of the food that is produced is either lost or wasted, contributing to a global food crisis with over 800 million going to bed hungry. Listen on as USAID experts speak with researchers and development professionals to explore solutions to this critical issue that demands a kitchen sink approach. When it comes to climate, food security, and food system sustainability, we have no time to waste. Thank you for joining us for the Food Loss and Waste podcast. This episode will explore actors to reduce food loss and waste, the private sector. This podcast is hosted by the USAID Research Community of Practice subgroup on food loss and waste, and will feature interviews with subject matter experts to explore the implications of and approaches to addressing food loss and waste. My name is Colin Van Buren, and I am a climate, youth, and inclusion advisor in the Bureau for Resilience and Food Security at USAID. And today I will be speaking with Jake Rickard Gilbert, Wyatt Proct, and Patrick Katiam from the Food Processing Innovation Lab. Welcome, Jake, Wyatt, and Patrick. Please introduce yourselves. Thank you, Colin. I'm Jake Ricker Gilbert, a professor in the Department of Agricultural Economics at Purdue University, and I direct the Food Processing and Post-Harvest Loss Innovation Lab, FPIL, that seeks to reduce food loss and waste and scale up uh, food food loss and waste reducing technologies in Kenya and Senegal. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Colin. Um, my name is Wyatt Proct. I'm a current um, master's student in the Department of Agricultural Economics at Purdue University, um, and I've been working on the study that we're going to talk about today. So excited to be here. Uh, thank you, Colin. My name is Dr. Patrick Tiem. I am assigned a post office science based at uh, Kenya Cultural and Livestock Research Organization and based at uh, Njoro. In, uh, in Nakuru. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you all so much. Uh, it's wonderful to have you here on the podcast. Um, and my first question is actually going to be directed to Jake. So, Jake, can you uh, can you please describe the study design and results for the FPIL's work, especially with youth in Kenya? Um, and can you emphasize maybe the youth that were most successful there and their stories? Ab- absolutely, thank you. Uh, so this work was funded by FPIL and also the Laser Pulse Consortium, that's a USAID project. Um, and it sought to try to address, address two, two challenges um, that are prevalent in Sub-Saharan Africa. The first is youth unemployment and underemployment. And the second is how do we scale up and get food loss and waste preventing technologies specifically um, loss reducing hermetic storage bags and low cost moisture meters to farmers at the end of the supply chain. Um, so what we did was, was to set up this, this study, this intervention as a randomized control trial with rural youth in Eastern Kenya, the counties of Machakos, Makweni and Kitui. We, we targeted youth groups, so youth that were members of groups that were already organized into clubs And we randomly picked 20 clubs to participate this year and 20 clubs served as a control for the next year uh, that we followed in in the first year. And we, the clubs that were treated, we randomly picked 10 members within each club to participate in the project. And the project linked those youth that were selected with agro dealers. So people who sell post-harvest inputs and other inputs through the private sector We provided them training with Calro leading the training and they were linked with the agro dealer and they were given inputs on collateral hermetic bags and uh, low cost moisture meters to sell on a commission basis with the agro dealer. And the hope was that they would sell these inputs uh, obviously make money and establish relationships with the agro dealers that would continue. And the outcomes we were interested in measuring were obviously income through sales and potentially increased other activities um, related to that business of selling. 
And then we wanted to see if there was an effect on consumption. And in addition, and why it's going to talk about this a little bit, motivation and aspirations. Um, so, so this started at the end of last year, the end of uh, 2021. The youth were trained. And then in the season that started around January of 2022, uh, when the harvest came in uh, around end of January, early February, the youth were given the bags. Uh, the youth put up collateral for the bags. They put up about 20% of the value of the bags to show commitment. And then they went out and started selling. Um, and then after harvest, about three months later, we went back and followed up with the youth um, to see how they did. And what we found was interesting. It was kind of what you might expect with a new business startups that you're starting, that some people did really well. Uh, let's say the top 25% of the distribution did well and made money and was successful and will probably continue selling. But the lower part of the distribution really wasn't successful. It wasn't really for them. Uh, and what we found that was interesting was that the people who had something going on already, for example, they had some kind of business already, it worked for them to sell these additional products as part of their product line. So for example, we had one young woman who sold women's clothing at a market. She just added the hermetic bags and the moisture meters to her product line. Also the tax, the motorcycle taxis, like the Boda Boda drivers, they did well because when they had customers riding behind them on their back, they would start selling the bags. So, so that was kind of interesting to see. Other quick interesting things, when we talk about youth, we're talking about the age range from 18 to 35. So the older people within that range, the, the people that were, say, closer to 30, the older youth uh, did better, possibly because they were more motivated, they had more training, and they needed to get things going than the younger youth who were less established. And about half of our participants were women, and women, we found, did just as well as men. So in terms of impacts, it was gender neutral. It wasn't like the, the young women did worse. They did just as well on average. Um, so those are the main findings. I think, you know, a certain number of people did well and will continue, but some people didn't. But I think it is a good way to help get input out to farmers who weren't using them before, and it will provide some employment uh, for borough youth. So that's all. That's I great. Yeah, thanks for that overview. And it's great, of course, from my position, great to hear about uh, ways that we can engage youth and include youth in our programs uh, and see them find success, even if it may not be all of them. So uh, I'd like to actually turn it over to Wyatt to ask, to dig more into this a little bit and ask you, Wyatt, what do you see as the unique opportunities that youth have, especially to reduce food loss and waste? And why do you think it's important to engage youth in this issue? Uh, thank you, Colin. Um, I'm actually going to start by answering the second question first and then tie it back into the first question. So a lot of the time when people think about rural youth, um, these people are often working in highly seasonal and are often underemployed individuals. So you can think about this as having gaps in their labor calendars where they're not able to work um, in economic activities as much as they would. So potentially in times of down, um, of down economic times when um, maybe they aren't working in agriculture and they're just sitting idle. Uh, kind of one of the things we wanted to look at with this study was being able to fill those gaps. So if um, by doing that, we wanted to involve them um, in the post-harvest uh, value chain by selling inputs to smaller farmers. Um, so as Jake kind of alluded to already, um, our study had minimal impact probably for the majority of the youth, but was successful for um, a small number at the top of the income distribution who may have already had other resources and may have been more well equipped to do better in the study versus um, those who didn't. Um, and I think one thing to keep in mind is that this has kind of been a larger theme that has been shown from studies that have evaluated business and technical training programs throughout the world. Um, not only involved in agriculture, but involved in other sectors, such as business training, um, where a lot of the time you provide people with training, but um, most of the time there's been a lack of impact. But that's not to say that there hasn't been positive things come out of this study. Um, one of the, in particular to food loss and waste, one of the things that we've seen is that um, the youth were actually able to connect new market linkages. So, 
Um, from our first follow up, we noticed that a bunch um, that a bunch of farmers, so over a hundred farmers, reported um, either adopting a hermetic storage bag, um, which is just a three layer bag um, that has kind of been scaled up throughout East Africa that allows farmers to store grain um, in a safer airtight position, so that way either mold or pests don't um, deal with it during storage. And then um, um, additionally, farmers also reported having their um, their moisture uh, measured to see if it was, or the grain moisture measured to see if the grain was uh, safe for consumption. Um, so that was something that was really important. So I think potentially youth have an important role to play in being able to create these linkages and help um, kind of extend these technologies out throughout the value chain. Um, but moving forward, um, there would just need to be more incentives identified um, for those youth to potentially have more um, remunerative um, benefits to continue going on. Um, and in terms of aspirations, we did notice that youth who had higher income aspirations at baseline did better than those with lower um, aspirations. And this is something that we kind of want to um, look into more. So actually we're returning for, um, to the field um, next month to actually see if there was a shift in people's aspirations um, over the medium term. So our baseline was last November and December. So potentially seeing if these sorts of interventions um, can lead to people's um, increased aspirations and see how that motivates them over the longer term. Um, and with that, um, I'll turn it over to you and Patrick. Thanks, Why? Yeah, that's that's great to kind of hone in on. And I think you started touching on this, but my, my question for Patrick uh, is kind of hopefully going to expand on that a little bit and ask Patrick, uh, what arguments should be made to you, do you think, to motivate them to adopt and sell technologies and practices to reduce food loss and waste? Is it profit? What is it? Thank you, Colin. So I, I think uh, that's a very nice question uh, to address. Uh, in developing countries like Kenya, youth actually constitutes a very critical segment that can be able to drive transformation in agriculture. Indeed, if we have to achieve food security and nutrition amidst other challenges that's facing the continent and even facing the society, there is therefore need to adopt very critical technologies and practices. And in this case, therefore, we must look at the issues that will be able to motivate the youth to adopt and be able to spearhead the relevant technologies. And I'm going to highlight a few issues, uh, and well, being able to highlight a very some some uh, some of these key issues. One of them that I'm, I, I I think is very critical is to showcase to the youth that agriculture is profitable enterprise. I think that's what's lacking, and it with huge opportunities to tap, especially at the last mile. You know, the youth comes across every area, so. If we can be able to showcase to the, to the youths that agriculture is profitable, then they can be able to be motivated to, in, to really be able to sell the relevant technology. The, the other aspect that I want to touch is the issues of uh, investing or developing technologies that are digital, digital marketing apps. And I'm, I'm looking because our youths are, 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 are in the, the bracket of a digital world. So youth would be able to appreciate technologies that are that are that are that are up to date in terms of the the applications. And I'm I'm looking at the issues like uh, why put the technologies in in a model like the Hooper model. This would really make youths not look more of energy, but using their brains, digit, using their brains and the digital. And they in that case they can be willing to engage in in the agriculture. And uh, this is a very critical area, even, even many studies have already revealed that youths cannot participate in technologies that are labor intensive. The other aspect, the other aspect that uh, very critical to consider as part of modification is to look at the issues of bundling some of the potential technologies that can help in reducing food loss and waste. With other farm, with other with other farm driven, uh, other farm market uh, demand products, 
such as fertilizers, pesticides. So we look at these post-harvest technologies with other inputs in, in a bundle so that uh, it's not only post-harvest technologies that uh, the youth would be concerned. So because if you look at agriculture, uh, it is seasonal, it is in segment. It, so there's a production, there's a post-harvest, and there's the marketing. So we need we need to bundle many of these technologies so that the youths can be able to, 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 to enjoy and be able to appreciate the value chain. The, the other aspect that I want to touch is uh, if we really we need we need to develop a reward system so that uh, and, and I, I think the actors in the agricultural sector can look at a reward system so that uh, and I'm talking about governments, local governments so that uh, the best performing youth can be recognized. This would really make the youth, and I'm, th I'm thinking issues like uh, recognizing youth to possibly take them to an holiday with a family. So uh, this can really motivate the youth to really spare more time to look at some of these technologies and be able to market them and be able to adopt. The last one, the last aspect I want to talk because of time, is to strengthen the transportation systems. I, I know the youths are people who would want to really navigate within the urban cities, but I'm sure if, if the government can and and part and, and and development partners and in collaborate with government can strengthen the transportation systems, then it means the youths can be able to reach each and every corner of the of the society, and and by so they do, they will find it easy for them to to really move uh, selling the technologies. And the last the last aspect I would want to mention is issues of uh, training opportunities. Why we want we want to train the youths and the farmers on issues of post harvest handling uh, as a key issues of reducing post harvest. For example, skills development, issues of record keeping. I'm, I'm sure the youths are, are, are engaging on this technology without some of those knowledge. So we need we need to package so that uh, they can also look at their uh, other opportunities beyond beyond the technologies and be able to amass a lot of knowledge. And I really want to thank you for the opportunity to participate in this uh, podcast uh, recording. Thank you very much, Collins. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, yeah, uh, it was great to hear you kind of speak to both sort of like specific things that can encourage youth, but also speak to the broader enabling environment and how to support them in that as well. So it was great to kind of hear. So I'd like to just quickly thank all three of you. Thanks, Jake, Wyatt, and Patrick for sharing your perspectives on uh, food loss and waste, on especially from this youth angle, which I know is near and dear to my heart. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you so much for joining us on our podcast. And we look forward to uh, speaking again, hopefully soon. Thank you for tuning in to USAID's Kitchen Sink. This podcast was produced by Nika Larian and is organized by the USAID Food Loss and Waste Community of Practice co-chairs Ahmed Kablan and Ann Vaughn. Additional thanks goes to Feed the Future, the U.S. government's global food security initiative and the USAID Center for Nutrition.